All right, we're going to look at the uh, metaphysical poet Henry Vaughan, uh, born 1621 and uh, dies in April of 1695. Uh, Vaughan is a Welshman, uh, poet, also a translator, um, writing in English. English is a second language for him. Welsh is his first language. And he also operated as a medical physician for much of his life. Uh, there's Vaughan in his early days uh, probably should be seen as a secular poet, but in uh, in and around 1650, he produces a volume of poetry called Silex Scintillans, um, which was published in two parts. The second part published in 1655, um, very much influenced by George Herbert. And it led him to uh, sort of express in his poetry a conversion experience, so such that he uh, denounced his previous uh, poetry as idle verse. And we can see that there is uh, a great deal of evidence uh, for him to show the depth of his convictions. There's a prose work that he writes called, called Mount of Olives. Um, centered obviously around the Olivet Discourse uh, of Jesus and also solitary devotions. But, and so uh, the poetry we're gonna look at from Vaughan is not from his earlier phase um, as a writer, but rather his religious phase. And um, um, I will say contemporaneous with that is his medical uh, practice, which is rather interesting as far as it, it belongs to um, secular or rather hermetic approaches to um, uh, uh, to physics or, or medicine, hermetical physics, and he translates a man by the name of uh, Henry Nolius's work, and uh, later on a uh, work called The Chemist's Key. So uh, by uh, uh, embracing hermetical physics, he is to some degree, and I talked about at the outset, the, in terms of the Elizabethan world picture, um, which follows certain practices in accordance with reason and order. Um, he is to some degree expressing this, this gradual shift towards materialism and to some degree obs obscurantism in terms of um, approach and to some degree more of a spiritual approach to nature which makes Vaughn a very interesting fellow, because in many ways, when you read Vaughn, you can hear, um, although he's writing before Wordsworth, echoes of Wordsworth, and obviously it's rather the other way around. Wordsworth appears to be echoing sentiments that he may have read in Henry Vaughn. But very much there is a, an approach to nature and the goodness of nature and the essential goodness of nature, which interested uh, Vaughn as a medical practitioner uh, in, in the same way in our day, I think we can see um, a very hol uh, various holistic approaches to medicine um, uh, becoming more and more uh, prominent and uh, getting greater and greater credibility as Western medicine and its approach is being brought into question. And so he's interesting on various levels. But he, he accounts this uh, shift, as I said, to George Herbert, who gave for Vaughan a model of his newfound spiritual life, and also his literary career for that matter. And he cites a spiritual quickening and a gift of gracious feeling, which he derived directly from Herbert. And, in, and that makes him very interesting to my mind. Um, and some think that he is superior to Herbert as a poet. I happen not to share that view, but he is very much certainly influenced by Herbert and so falls under that influence. So if you want to trace the trajectory of metaphysical poets now, we've moved from its early beginnings in John Donne, uh, very much uh, postulated on the influence of the microcosm and the macrocosm, which is a very ancient way of looking at human bodies, for instance, and the relation of man to the cosmos, seeing uh, the elements within 
the human being that are also to be found, the, the very same ones that are to be found in the universe, with the exception of the spirit, which is seen as something rather distinct. Um, and we can see the shift from that to George Herbert's, to my mind, more uh, reformed and more theologically inclined uh, metaphysical poetry, less predicated on the microcosm, macrocosm analogy, uh, and more uh, scriptural in its intentions, and certainly more devotional in its practices. We don't get the scandalous uh, elements in Herbert that we seem to see in Dunn to his great delight. But you can see influences in both ways. Um, more recently, we looked at Andrew Mar Marvell and how he starts to move more in the direc direction of pastoral poetry as well, as well as Vaughan. And uh, we did talk about to some degree how you could see uh, some sort of um, beginnings of romanticism, as it were, in Marvell's poetry. But as I said, uh, it's clear from uh, some of Marvell's poetry that he is clearly adhering to a uh, Christian view of human nature and the fallenness of the world. And, and in that sense, he is most clearly differentiating himself, himself from uh, Wordsworth and the Romantic movement, uh, which may begin uh, in Rousseau, for whom nature is an unfallen realm and society is a fallen realm. This dichotomy between the unfallen and the Edenic state of nature, uh, which uh, humanity is born into, as it were, and then the fall comes about gradually through socialization, etc. That's that's uh, Rousseau's account. It's also Wordsworth's account. We don't get that in, as I said last time, we don't get that with uh, Andrew Marvell. Marvell clearly sees uh, the world as already fallen, and it cannot thereby redeem us by returning to nature, because nature itself has been corrupted by human sin. And so he is uh, orthodox in that sense from a Christian point of view. Um, whereas in Vaughan, we don't get the same sense of orthodoxy there. And we do, uh, to my mind, see a, a, a leaning towards what we will see in full-blown form in, in Wordsworth. But there's no doubt about the influence of Vaughan on later writers, Wordsworth being one of them, Tennyson another. Uh, and so he is a major poet unto himself and deserves uh, some discussion here at the tail end of the course. I'm going to look at a few of his poems. His major volume is uh, Silak Sintelans. I'm not going to look at that. It's too long. I am going to look at several of his poems, though, and I'm not going to do it in the way I've done it with some of them and read it through in detail because the poems are just too long. But I will try and summarize what's going on in the poets, and I'll read some of them. The, poets, uh, the poems I'm going to handle are The Retreat, firstly, secondly, And Do They So, thirdly, I Walked the Other Day, fourthly, Cock Crowing, and finally, The Book. So those are the poems I am going to handle and to look at some of the prominent features of Vaughan's poetry. And as I say, we can see the early uh, glimpses of a romantic view of the world. Now, this again, Vaughn is not a romantic. He sees himself in the uh, wake of George Herbert, and he is very much influenced by Herbert. So in his most famous book of poetry, Silex Sintelans, you can see the poetry is, is really all, uh, very biblical. And he, he uh, challenges the idea of what uh, living in a biblical way might mean in the 1650s. Now, in the 1650s, this is at the height of Cromwell's Republic. And so he is trying uh, to um, speak to the idea uh, of the godly nation in which he is living under Cromwell's government. And for him, he is operating outside of the framework there because he is more or less an Anglican survivalist during this Commonwealth period. And he uh, has taken for himself the task that George Herbert initially um, uh, grasped for his aim to write true hymns. And, and one of the ways in which he does this is he sees the story of Genesis as an analog uh, for his own experiences as a Christian. And, uh, and one of the things that becomes clear is he 
Uh, there's a, a moment in her in Herbert in Vaughn's own life in which he becomes terribly sick, and he is spared from that illness. And to some degree, he sees the uh, uh, Isaiah's song or Isaiah's Hezekiah's song within the book of Isaiah. That is Isaiah 38 verses 9 to 20. If you want to have a look at it. When, I, when Hezekiah had fallen ill and the Lord saved him. And this was a transition, a transformative period for Isaiah. And he is to some degree denouncing uh, the millennialism or the mill millenarian uh, sense that was being uh, propagated under Cromwell's government and questioning it and advocating a more Anglican uh, version of that. So he sees himself and he sees Herbert in contradistinction to some of the other practices of the day. But what is more interesting to me, I mean, that in itself is an interesting aspect. Another, though, is this move towards nature as a, as a form of healing and, and perhaps even to some degree uh, redemption. But to illustrate that, let me go to a poem. And the first poem I'm going to look at, as I said, is George Herbert's or Henry Bonds, rather, The Retreat. So let me read that. It's short enough. I will read that, and then we'll make comments. And we will see uh, something along the lines of what we read in William Wordsworth's Immortality Ode. Namely, this idea of early childhood being a, a state of innocence and the aim to recover that lost innocence in the adult. But you can hear the echoes yourself as I read it. The Retreat by Henry Vaughan. Happy those early days when I shined in my angel infancy before I understood this place appointed for my second race or taught my soul to fancy aught but a white celestial thought. When yet I had not walked above a mile or two from my first love and looking back at that short space could see a glimpse of his bright face. When on some gilded cloud or flower, my gazing soul would dwell an hour, and in those weaker glories spy some shadows of eternity. Before I taught my tongue to wound my conscience with a sinful sound, or had the black art to dispense a several sin to every sense, but felt through all this fleshly dress bright shoots of everlastingness. Oh, how I long to travel back and tread again that ancient track, that I might once more reach that plain where first I left my glorious train, from whence the enlightened spirit sees that shady city of palm trees. But ah, my soul with too much stay is drunk and staggers in the way. Some men a forward motion love, but I by backward steps would move, and when this dust falls to the urn in that state, I came, return. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And so we can see uh, in many ways, if you read Wordsworth's uh, intimations of immortality and reflections on early childhood, something of the visionary gleam that Wordsworth speaks of in that poem, uh, reflected in Vaughan's sense of his what he calls angel infancy, a happy childhood in which he had white celestial thoughts, not green thoughts in a green shade, as Marvell has put it, but rather that which had uh, echoes of eternity and that of heaven. And he could see glimpses of God's bright face, his, his bright face capitalized here. And he would see this before he taught his tongue to wound his conscience with a sinful sound before he was able to uh, use language and defraud his, his own identity. And he wishes to travel back. Now, he, on the other hand, recognizes that he cannot do so. And furthermore, that returning to nature is no means by which he can recover that lost innocence. And this is where uh, Vaughn will differ from Wordsworth, because Wordsworth thinks that through the imagination, he can project himself into his past consciousness and bring it with him and with a sort of a, an imaginary uh, second innocence will carry forward a redeemed life here on earth we get nothing of that in Vaughan but we do get the sense of the goodness of nature 
uh, as something which he, in a sense, sees an, as an analog to heaven, if not the earthly paradise. So that's it makes this a very interesting poem, I think, unto itself. It's a good place to begin. Let me now move on to the second poem we'll look at, and that is the one framed as a question, and do they so? Let me just share that with you. And do they so? And he cites a Latin uh, phrase here, which he's then repeated in English. So I'll just read the English. For the created things watching with head erect await the revelation of the sons of God. Speaking of uh, the mystery, uh, Paul speaks of how creation is itself groaning in anticipation of the eschatological fulfillment of this world and that all that it promises which has been defrauded by sin, and yet because of Christ's redemption is being renewed. So he speaks to the millenarian concerns of eschatology and how they are brought into the present uh, world and its consciousness and its sense. Very much of a religious theme here. And so he cites this, and then he questions it. And do they so? Have they a sense of aught but influence? Can they lift their heads, their heads lift and expect and groan too? Why the elect can do no more? My volume said that they were all dull and dead. They judged them senseless and their state wholly inanimate. Go seal up thy looks and burn thy books. I would I were a stone or tree or flower by pedigree or some poor highway herb, or spring to flow, or bird to sing, then should I, tied to one sure state all day, expect my date. But I am sadly loose and stray a giddy blast each way. Oh, let me not thus range. Thou canst not change. Sometimes I sit with thee and tarry an hour or so, then vary. Thy other creatures in this scene, thee only aim and mean. Some rise to seek thee, and with heads erect peep from their beds. Others, whose birth is in the tomb and cannot quit the womb, sigh there and groan for thee their liberty. Oh, let me not do less. Shall they watch while I sleep or play? Shall I thy mercies still abuse with fancies, friends, or news? Oh, brook it not. Thy blood is mine, and my soul should be thine. Oh, brook it not. Why wilt thou stop after whole showers, one drop? Sure thou wilt joy to see thy sheep with thee. So this is a reflection of a man on how the whole created order bespeaks the glory of God. Jesus says that if the uh, Jerusalem had not greeted him in expectation of his triumphal entry, the very stones would have cried out. And Herbert echoes the sense that all creation does praise their him. But do, do they anticipate and wait with heads erect the revelation of the sun? Do they actually actively do so? Or do they do so more passively, um, unconsciously, by means of what he calls here influence? And this word influence we can see is derived from, oh gosh, clicked on that inadvertently, uh, influence from the idea of the old Ptolemaic cosmology, the influence of the planets on the uh, planets below and on the creatures on earth. So uh, uh, basically uh, an imperceptible movement from the music of the spheres on downwards. Have they a sense of aught but influence? Do they have a sense that they're actually being explicitly called and they're explicitly conscious and they're looking for that influence of the created things. Are they alert, in other words, to the redemption that Christ wrought at the cross and it has now ushered in the coming age to come? Have they done so? Can they lift their heads and expect and groan too? And his answer to this is the elect can do no more. My volume said they were all dull and dead well, and judged them senseless. Those who said that the elect 
were not aware of this, he rejects this view. These books that rejected the idea that the elect are in fact anticipating and seeing the signs of the coming kingdom all around them. He rejects that view. In the second stanza, he, he wishes that he were a stone. This is the optative sense as often in the case here uh, in 17th century poetry. Uh, because these would sing without contradiction and be sure all the time. There would be no uh, vacillating between expectancy and apathy and ignorance of the state of expectation. But he says as a human being, he doesn't have the same sense of certitude that he sees in the stones, the trees, the flowers, the herb, the spring, or the bird that always seem to praise God. On the contrary, he is loose and stray and moves and vacillates, as I say, between praising God and then ignoring him altogether. But sometimes in the third stanza, I sit with thee, thee being God, and tarry an hour or so, and then vary. Uh, other creatures in the scene, the only aim in me. So the created order, the natural order, seems to be unbroken in its praise of God. The heavens declare the glory of God and this, uh, the earth declares the glory of God and the skies showeth forth his handiwork, it says in the psalm. And there's no sense of uh, uh, any breach in that. So the natural laws of this world testify to God's glory. He, on the other hand, being a fallen human being and a sinner at that, contradicts the rule of nature otherwise uh, that is unbroken. Um, and some rise to seek thee and with heads erect peep from their beds. Others, now he's talking about the, so the natural order, the non-human order is so. How about those who are sleeping? And how about those who are uh, fallen asleep? Those who are the elect who are dead and those who are yet unborn. They groan, but those who live in this life are contradicted by their sin. Those who have already died in, in faith and hope in Jesus Christ, those are waiting and expectant without contradiction. Likewise, the unborn. But those who are in this world live a life of contradiction. On the one hand, they claim that Christ is their savior and they live for that. They believe they've been redeemed by it. On the other hand, they sin. And they continue to sin, even though they wish uh, earnestly not to do so. And so they live this dual life of contradiction. That's what he spe uh, speaks of here. But he says that those who, who are uh, not contradicted by their sinful nature, he wishes he were like them. And so he concludes at the fourth stanza, oh, let me do no less. Shall they watch while I sleep or play? Shall I thy mercy still abuse with fancies, friends, or news? Oh, brook it not. So this is an earnest prayer for him to le lead a life that does not contradict his profession of faith, does not contradict his credo. And he is hopeful because God's grace is ever merciful and ever abundant. He says, why wilt thou stop? And he says this to himself as a consolation after whole showers, one drop. No, he only wants one drop of that grace. And he's assured with, that he will receive it. Sure, thou wilt joy to see thy sheep with thee. So he has the blessed assurance that Jesus is his and he is Christ's. So again, a powerful religious poem using natural elements in it, but very much Christian in his emphasis and his direction, his implication of, of God in an intimate sense. The thou and the thee here throughout the poem and thine are reflections of that. And as I say, although it sounds somewhat like Wordsworth, it's more explicitly Christian in its emphasis. Let me now move to, I walked the other day, put it up on the screen for you. And I will seek to read it, but it is not as short. And so this becomes a little challenging, but I'll read it anyway. Better to hear the poem than hear me. I walked the other day to spend my hour into a field 
where I sometimes had seen the soil to yield a gallant flower. But winter now had ruffled all the bower and curious store I knew there heretofore. Yet I, who search love not to peep and peer the face of things, thought with myself there might be other springs besides this here, which, like cold friends, sees us but once a year, and so the flower might have some other bower. Then taking up what I could nearest spy, I digged about that place where I had seen him to grow out, and by and by I saw the warm recluse alone to lie, where fresh and green he lived of us unseen. Many a question, intricate and rare, did I there strow, but all I could exhort extort was that he now did there repair such losses as befell him in this air, and would ere long come forth most fair and young. This past, I threw the clothes quite o'er his head, and stung with fear of my own frailty, dropped down many a tear upon his bed, then sighing whispered, happy are the dead. What peace doth now rock him asleep below, and yet how few believe such doctrine springs from a poor root, while all the winter sleeps here underfoot and hath no wings to raise it to the truth and light of things, but is still trod by every wandering clod. O thou, whose spirit did at first inflame and warm the dead, and by a sacred incubation fed with life this frame, which once had neither form, being, nor name, Grant I may so thy steps track here below, that in these masks and shadows I may see thy sacred way, and by those hid ascents climb to that day which breaks from thee who art in all things, though invisibly. Show me thy peace, thy mercy, love, and ease, and from this care, where dreams and sorrows reign, lead me above, where light, joy, leisure, and true comforts move without all pain. There, hid in thee, show me his life again, at whose dumb urn thus all the year I mourn. Again, he walked the other day, and he walked it in a field. And let me see... Uh... And in the field saw a flower, and the flower and the what he saw to search there in the greenness um, was the echo uh, of the, the life that now he sees as lost, which he hopes to break forth. And um, Again, it's a return to nature, a nature, though, that gives a, forth a sense of the freshness of things, uh, which very much sounds like a uh, poem by a Catholic writer of the 19th century by the name of Gerald Manley Hopkins. Hopkins also speaks and uses nature in the same sense that Vaughan does, and perhaps uh, Hopkins is a better analogy for the understanding and use of nature and the redemptive, redemptive aspects of nature that he sees without necessarily attributing a uh, whole scale redemption to nature. Um, so Hopkins might be a, another poet that's worth looking at in comparison to Vaughan and see Vaughan as an early anticipation of Hopkins. I'm running short on time. I'm gonna skip over the cock, cock crowing uh, and go to the book. Uh, it seems a suitable way to conclude a uh, look at Vaughn. Um, cock crowing is uh, very much of a, a like piece in the sense that there is an anticipation uh, of the heads erect looking at the redemption and anticipating the light as the uh, cockerel does at the break of day at dawn. Um, the book is similarly minded in terms of the way in which the uh, created order has been transformed uh, for godly purposes and so forth, a perennial theme in Christian 
uh, poetry. Let me look at the book and we'll see some of the features of it. So let me read. It's a bit longer. That's why I cut the uh, other one. But the book, Eternal, Make, Eternal God, maker of all that have lived here since the man's fall, the rock of ages, in whose shade they live unseen, when here they fade. Thou knewest this paper when it was mere seed, and after that but grass, before twas dressed or spun, and when made linen, who did wear it then? What were their lives, their thoughts and deeds, whether good corn or fruitless weeds? Thou knewest this tree when a green shade covered it, since a cover made, and where it flourished, grew and spread, as if it never should be dead. Thou knewest this harmless beast, when he did live and feed by thy decree on each green thing, then slept well fed, clothed with his skin, this skin which now lies spread, a covering for this aged book, which makes me wisely weep and look on my own dust. Mere dust it is, but not so dry and clean as this. Thou knewest and sawest them all, and though now scattered thus, dost know them so. O knowing glorious spirit, when thou shalt restore trees, beasts, and men, when thou shalt make all new again, destroying only death and pain, give him amongst thy works a place who in them loved and sought thy face. So what he sees here in the natural order is a book, the book of nature. Now, this is a theme which is certainly present in the 17th century, to a lesser degree, the 16th. But certainly in the 17th, the idea that there are two, God has two books. The one is the book of grace, special revelation, the Bible. This is the word of God, in which God reveals things that we cannot see in nature. Um, Namely, the account of what happens, the God's full revelation is the redemption of the world, the sending of his son uh, to atone for human sin, his, his death and resurrection, and ultimately the uh, triumphant eschatological fulfillment of the uh, early promise of creation in the new heavens and the new earth, when as... Uh, Vaughn says here, when thou shalt make all new again, destroying only death and pain, as it says at the end, when the uh, bride comes down from heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem, um, there will be no more pain or sorrow or death or weeping, because God will have removed all those things in the eschatological fulfillment. But Vaughn sees the uh, eschatological glimpses of that good or good uh, creation already present in the natural order. And he sees it in various forms. He saw it at the outset in the paper of the book, which began as seed, which then grew to grass and then was transformed through human cultivation into linen, which was worn as clothes and then uh, differentiated uh, the life of growing things between corn or weeds. Also speaks of the trees in the same way, that they have a transformation which speaks to a deathless existence, and yet we see the trees die just as the seed dies. And likewise, the beasts, which now whose skin is the uh, cover of the book that he is reading here, the paper and the, uh, and the, uh, the, the wood of the trees, which makes the cover. And then finally, the, the outer cover, which is the animal skin, which then uh, binds the book. All of these things are represented in the book. And he's not so much focusing on the words that are written within the book, but the actual uh, physical uh, structure of the book. It's made of the works of nature. And he can see in the works of nature, 
something along the lines of an analogy with what he can read in the book of grace. And that analogy is the one that he is holding strongly in this little poem that he calls the book. It's a splendid poem. It reflects very well uh, many of the themes that we've already seen in Vaughan. It reflects his religious devotion. It reflects his sense of himself as a hymnist, um, because many of these hymn, these uh, poems can be seen as hymns of praise sung to God, but they're really songs about the book of nature as a reflection or analogy of the book of grace. Um, and I think that in that sense, there are some similarities, as I say, with uh, romantic movements and ideas, but obviously notes of, of dissonance, which I've also identified because Vaughan sees very strongly the necessity of Christ in his work and God uh, the per a person in a personal form in a way that we certainly do not see in Rousseau and do not really see in the early Wordsworth, although later on he adapts his verse somewhat to sound a little bit more Christianized, but certainly in the early elements, um, the Immortality Ode and the early versions of the Prelude, etc., we do not see, quite frankly. Um, there's uh, nature is seen as a material thing with spiritual power, as I say in my romantics course, we see his panentheism coming through. That is not the case here with Vaughn. But that concludes my discussion of Vaughn. I hope you found it helpful. I think he is a fitting conclusion of the course. He goes in a different direction, but all the same, uh, well worth reading and uh, your time. Thank you.